Hello, I'm Lorna Warwick, and I am the CEO of the Lymphoma Coalition. It's my pleasure to be with you all here today and talking a bit about partnering organizations and how we're reaching around the world. So the Lymphoma Coalition is a global network of patient organizations. Currently, we have 83 member organizations in 52 countries. Everything that you see colored here in teal is where we have at least one member organization. And we're loosely divided into these regions. And where we have these little red stars is where I actually have a staff or a team member working to help support our member organizations globally. But before I explain a little bit more about the coalition, I think it's important to explain some of the rationale we use to decide where and how we work. And this, this explanation between the difference between equality and equity is really important to us. So if you look over here on this side of the screen where it says equality, you can see equality means that you're giving exactly the same boost to everybody. Yet, when, you, when you're this little guy here, the problem is you are never ever tall enough to see the game and to see what is happening. Instead, for Lymphoma Coalition, we focus on equity. How do we get everybody to get good access and be able to participate and, and build community locally to ensure that their patients are well taken care of? And sometimes that means that some need more of a boost than others to, to make that happen. So when you look at the vision of the Lymphoma Coalition, it's equity in lymphoma outcomes across borders. What we're trying to do is raise everybody up to a decent level of care. And our mission is an enabling global impact by fostering a lymphoma ecosystem that ensures local change and evidence-based action. And there are some things that are important to us very specifically in this. We work globally, but the, the point of us working and doing what we do is that there is a local change. So it's actually impacting patients at the end of the day and everything is based in really good evidence. So the Lymphoma Coalition was founded way back in 2002 by four organizations represented here. And really this was just a group of advocates who happened to meet at the American Society of Hematology meeting called ASH sometimes. And they started having a chat and they were like, wow, you knew that, I didn't know that, or you do that program, that sounds really good. We don't do that and decided that there was a lot they could learn from each other. And this is really how the coalition was born. And this, when you look at this, uh, this cartoon, um, science is complicated, right? The information coming out about lymphomas is quite complicated. And there's a lot of it. There's been a lot of changes, positive changes in lymphoma treatments over the last number of years. And there's still a lot of really active uh, research going on within the disease. So the information is changing all the time. And for our patient organization members, it's hard to stay on top of the breadth of knowledge, especially when you consider, even though we're talking about cutaneous lymphomas here, when we take into account all the lymphomas, there's over 80 different subtypes. So there's lots and lots of information coming forward. One of the things the coalition focuses on is taking that information and communicating it back to our members in an understandable format, highlighting what's really important and what is something that perhaps is cool to know, but not necessarily going to have an impact anytime soon on, on treatment and care for patients. So that's one of the roles that we undertake. And the other is really best practice sharing. And here you can see a picture from the coalition. Uh, we do a global patients, uh, global summit, sorry. Every year uh, we used to meet face-to-face. -face, so this was back in 2019 when we could still do that. Uh, recently, of course, we've been meeting virtually, but the global summit is an excellent way for our members to share what they're doing, what works well for them, any lessons they've learned, and then others in the community can learn from them and perhaps implement those same programs or learnings into their own work. So really best practice sharing and information sharing was how the coalition started. 
Now we still do those things, but we also do some advocacy. And what we mean by advocacy is how do we use our knowledge and our strength as, as an organization and our strength as a coalition? How do we use that to influence changes to the healthcare systems to ultimately get better care for patients? That may include uh, getting access to new medications or treatments, but also things like how do we improve how clinical trials work so there aren't so many steps for patients to fill out or so many tests that patients have to have if they want to participate? So we do lots of different kinds of advocacy as well. And across both of those pillars of, of our work, our, really our goal is, are we having impact at the end of the day? What is happening with the information we're providing? Are there good outcomes from the advocacy work that we do? And the coalition is unusual in that our audiences are not really patients. Most patient organizations, so most nonprofit organizations that you think about are working directly with patients and they do an amazing job. But we focus with our work in with other audiences. So primarily you'll see the red heart is our member organizations. And those are the, the patient organizations working in these different countries around the world. They're the ones that are having the direct impact with the patients. Our role with our member organizations is making sure they have good information, the skills that they need, and the support that they need to, so that they can have really good um, uh, information, again, to share with patients and know how to influence and change health systems in their own countries. We work with healthcare professionals. And when we work with those, we're often um, involved with scientific conferences. So we go to places like the American Society of Hematology, um, International Society of uh, Cutaneous Lymphoma. So lots of different types of conferences and different healthcare professionals. Uh, by the way, we also work with nurses as well as doctors making sure they really understand what are the key issues for patients. So hopefully we can help direct research to address key concerns. We can improve perhaps patient and doctor communication so patients at the end of the day get better care. And of course, healthcare professionals then directly interact with patients and, and hopefully this all, all this work positively impacts that. We work with policymakers often around, like I mentioned before, therapy approval, so we can get uh, patients access to, to the best treatments. We work with industry, pharmaceutical companies. Um, of course, they're responsible for creating these new therapies, so we want to make sure they're directing their energies in a way that really addresses patient need. We do work with the media. We do some awareness campaigns, which I'll talk about in a minute. And of course, then, um, patients can, can access what the media is producing. So we don't necessarily work with patients themselves or the general public much, but we sort of do. And I'll give you a couple of examples as well of where we do directly interact with patients and how that works. Most of the time though, when you're looking for information and support as a patient, we're directing you back to our member organizations who are doing a fabulous job at the country level. But today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about three areas of work we do. This is not everything we do, but this will help give you an idea of how we're working to build, um, build a great community worldwide. So when we look at awareness, one of the key things that we lead is World Lymphoma Awareness Day. This happens every 15th of September, so uh, very, very soon. And we encourage everybody to participate in this campaign. When we look at World Lymphoma Awareness Day, it really is just let's generate some, some awareness around lymphomas. Most people have no idea what a lymphoma is until they're diagnosed. So how do we help people understand what the disease is? How do we help people understand what the symptoms are, what they need to look for and when? How do we help people understand what are key issues that our patients are facing? The theme for the campaign changes every year. And for this year, really, we're looking at the impact that COVID-19 has had on lymphoma care and diagnoses worldwide. So 
If we consider um, last fall, cancer diagnoses were down worldwide by approximately 40%. This did not mean that suddenly there were no cancers happening. What it meant is simply they were not getting diagnosed. We were having so many issues with hospitals where hospitals were focused on COVID care and protection for patients that um, the general public, if you had symptoms of something, were having a hard time getting in to see their doctor or potentially were not even calling their do doctor to, to go for, for a screening of any kind because they were worried about contracting COVID. So those were, are some of the key issues that we're seeing. Um, as well, because there's a delay in diagnosis, then we have cases of cancer that are more advanced. And so patients, went, by the time they actually get to see a doctor, have a more complicated case of lymphoma in our case, and it takes more treatment and care perhaps to, um, to treat them effectively. At the same point in time, there's a group called the Global Cancer Coalitions Network, of which Lymphoma Coalition is a, a member. And it's made of all of the key, um, key cancer types globally, so solid tumors as well as hematology. So um, when we asked our patient organizations for their feedback on the impact of COVID, they were talking about that it, what they see locally in their countries is that there is very few functions that are back to pre-COVID levels. So this continues to be an issue. Even though the data that we had about cancer diagnoses is going back about a year, our uh, member organizations are talking about there's still problems with getting people into hospitals and, and getting diagnoses. There's still delays in, um, in testing and there are delays in getting access to radiation machines, for example. As well, it's really important to note that for the majority of patient organizations, they had their own issues with COVID. Two thirds of patient organizations had problems fundraising because most of them do fight face-to-face -face fundraising, you know, those walkathons, those dinners that they hold, those kinds of things. And when they weren't able to do that, they saw a big fall in their income. So with an average drop of close to 50%. So our patient organizations are working really hard to support patients um, through the pandemic, not only with their information about lymphoma itself, but also now adding in information about COVID and that impact on their lymphoma care um, with less money and less resources. What isn't mentioned here is there's also a 70% drop in fund, uh, sorry, in volunteering. So um, not only less money available for our nonprofit organizations, but less human resource support as well. So we came up with a theme for this year called We Can't Wait. And these are things that the messaging that we're using with this campaign. We can't wait for the pandemic to end to start diagnosing lymphomas. These delays can lead to a more serious disease and also potentially a negative prognosis. We need to get people diagnosed. We want people themselves to be aware that they need to take care of their own health. People need to be aware of the signs and symptoms of lymphoma, and if they're experiencing to not delay and go and get help. The issue with some of the symptoms of lymphomas in general is that they are the same as the symptoms of COVID-19. So that can be confusing for, for people, but if these signs are persistent, if they're happening, for long periods of time, they need to go and seek help from a medical professional. We can't wait any longer to treat lymphomas. We totally understand the changes that were made to healthcare systems because of COVID. We understand why that was necessary, but at the same point in time, we have to resume standard treatment practices for our patients now. We can't continue to delay or make changes on tr for, uh, treatments for patients, we need to get them their best care available for them now when they need it. We can't wait to pay attention when living with lymphomas. We know some patients that have missed their appointments, for instance, if they're having new symptoms, they have not told their doctor, again, because they don't want to burden them perhaps, if they know that they're involved with COVID care, 
they're concerned about getting COVID, so don't want to go to the hospital, don't want to go to a clinic. Um, lots of reasons. They may, because of local COVID restrictions, have a really hard time finding a way to travel. So maybe they can't get to the clinic. Lots of things are interfering, but we need to make sure people are getting the help and support they need. As well, we just can't wait to support people living with lymphomas in terms of local patient organizations who are providing much, much, much needed support. So we're encouraging everybody to volunteer or support the local organizations as well. So that's World Lymphoma Awareness Day this year. There's lots of good information on worldlymphomaawarenessday.org. So I encourage you to take a peek. I know that there's stuff coming out too from the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation. So we encourage you to participate. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about community building. And I'm gonna give specific examples of how we work or have been working with the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation. You can see this photo here. This is Susan from CLF, and she's also the chair of the board of directors of Lymphoma Coalition. So this is her presenting at the last time we did a face-to-face -face meeting in 2019. So the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation has a base in the United States and has done amazing work in getting really good information about cutaneous lymphoma to patients and providing support. What we can do as a coalition is help connect Susan and the great work that's happening with CLI to the rest of the world. So make sure she knows patient groups in other countries that want to support patients with uh, cutaneous lymphomas, help them set up their systems, help them understand the disease. Because what Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation is, is a great information source. They spend all of their time working in cutaneous lymphomas. So they often know far more than member organizations in other countries with a really broad remit. Remember I said there's over 80 different subtypes of lymphoma. And some of our member organizations even work beyond lymphoma and work in all blood cancers. So they're dealing with leukemias and myeloma and other things as well. So having information available coming from a really great source like the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation is important. And so what we can do together is create resources in a way that we know as the Lymphoma Coalition work well for translation with other countries. And so we provide those out to our member organizations as one example of what we might do together. And these, the information we provide, even though we provide it in a nice format that's already branded, um, our member organizations are free to use any way they like, and they can completely brand it with their own, um, with their own logos, et cetera. As well, the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation has great relationships with the key doctors. When you think about cutaneous lymphomas, uh, it's different than other lymphomas as often patients are, are treated by dermatologists rather than hematologists, though sometimes they get both of them. So we don't necessarily know the dermatology community, but CLF does. And so it's a good way as well to connect everybody into their local doctors they may not be aware of, who are really the primary people treating cutaneous lymphomas. At the coalition though, we keep track of things like who has access to what medication. We have a database that we maintain specifically for this. We also have a database where we look at clinical trials that are happening. So we can see, um, we only look at phase two and, and beyond clinical trials. So ones that are closer to getting to the point they may come to market, just to see who is doing what in any particular space. So we can do a quick analysis and see how many trials there are for cutaneous lymphomas happening at any one time. We can take all of that information and analyze it together. So when I talk about Lymphoma Coalition being a wee bit different than other traditional nonprofit organizations, because we don't work with patients, we work with patient organizations and other people. As a result, my team complement is a little bit different. I have epidemiologists on staff. So uh, people that look in, uh, spend a lot of time looking into data and doing data analysis in public health. And so because I have staff with this kind of skill set, 
we can do an analysis and see all oh, those key centers, those leading centers in those different countries for treating cutaneous lymphoma. Are they the ones with the best access to the medications? Are they doing the clinical trials? Who else do they support? So are there feeder countries where they don't have that kind of expertise? Are they able to support and help them uh, to ensure that patients are getting access to the best care? So lots of different ways we are working together. So at the end of the day, we have a coordinated, credible community. Now, when we look at cutaneous lymphomas, it's important to remember it's a very rare subtype. We don't want people recreating the wheel. It already exists. Often those programs and information has been created by the CLF. So how do we share that out? Because it's a rare subtype, there's limited funds available. So how do we maximize the money? And again, avoiding duplication is one of the ways we can do that. How do we make sure everybody stays up to date? We coordinate and we talk and we um, make plans together so that we're all working in the same direction, maybe picking up different pieces, but at the same point in time, building a much better, better community overall that is having a positive impact on the patient. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is data generation and analysis. And every two years, the um, Lymphoma Coalition does a global patient survey. And this is really to gather information on the patient's perspective on information, support, and outcomes. And we did a survey in 2020, right before the pandemic was an issue for most of the world. So, but it was still a problem in Asia Pacific at the time. And we had almost 12,000 respondents, as you can see here, which is great. Now within that though, we had just over 500 uh, patients and caregivers whose uh, connection was through cutaneous lymphoma. So we have a nice little data set, largely thanks to the work of Susan and some others who focus in the cutaneous lymphoma space and we're encouraging patients and caregivers to reply. So if you look here, this is some of the type of information that we're able to pull from um, from this survey. So we asked people about the amount of information that they have. We found some, done some research in the past that show that patients who have an adequate amount of information actually report a better overall patient experience. So we're really um, focused on these patients that say they don't have enough information. So really then it's like, how do we work, sorry, with this group right here? and make sure that more patients are getting good information up front. And you'll see here, when we look at global, this is all the other lymphomas is what we mean here. And then we look at cutaneous lymphoma. Cutaneous lymphoma patients are struggling to get good information at their diagnosis with over 40% of people saying they didn't get enough. This is an issue. So it's one focus of areas, how do we get better information to these patients? We can look at physical and medical side effects. So you can see here that these are symptoms of the cancer itself, and these are side effects of treatment over on this side. And you'll notice though, that some of these are the same, whether you're, um, it's a symptom of lymphoma or if it's a symptom, a side effect of the treatment. People experience pain, people experience fatigue, and people experience um, skin issues. So this is showing that even though um, the treatments might be reducing the impact of the cancer overall, it's not necessarily getting rid of all of the issues that are really impacting a patient's quality of life. And so this gives us good information to go back to doctors, researchers, and pharmaceutical companies to say that there's more work to be done. We look at fatigue, for instance, when uh, the patients who said that they had fatigue were asked to rate their fatigue on a scale out of 10. So those who were saying that they had a more significant fatigue were able to tell us what's it's, what it is impacting in their life. So, you know, their general activity level is less than they would like. They can't do the things that somebody of their same age normally would be able to do. They can't do physical activity, you know, walking or sports or whatever. The general activity would be more related to housework or 
or cooking or going to work or those things that we have to do. And then your mood, how you're feeling about your life is impacted. We also ask, are you discussing about these things with your doctor? And you can see here that um, over a quarter of patients don't tell their doctor about their fatigue. And this is concerning because there are things that, that doctors could do to help, um, but they have to be aware that something is happening before they can treat it. But again, even though there are things that doctors could do, when we asked patients, what did the doctor do after you told them about fatigue? You can see that the largest portion said that they didn't take any action. So this is a big concern for us because there are clinical practice guidelines explaining what to do when a patient indicates they have fatigue. So there is guidance for a doctor available on um, how they should be supporting a patient. Psychosocial effects. Again, we're comparing this to all the other lymphomas and you can see there's a higher fear of lymphoma progression in cutaneous lymphomas, more concern about their body image, and anxiety and depression are still um, significant issues for our patients. So lots of areas where patients are needing more support. So if you remember this piece on the audiences, um, if we look at how we would take the information from the survey and work with each of these groups, you'll see with member organizations, we'll create some resources that address the key issues we find from the survey. Here's an example of something we created with fatigue that members could use. We also do some training with them. We help improve their skills. So do they know how to advocate for change? Do they have, we can give them data to help them go to regulators and ask for different, um, different treatments to be available. With healthcare professionals, we present at professional conferences. This is an example of a presentation we did to a recent, recent cutaneous lymphoma scientific conference. And then we also create things like this is actually a quick taking of those clinical practice guidelines and breaking it down into a simple chart for doctors and hopeful, hopefully they will start using and actually following those guidelines. We give data to policymakers, which can impact what therapies are approved and what aren't. We work with patient, sorry, with pharmaceutical companies to help them understand the true patient perspective, what's really bothering a patient, so that we can um, get them to rethink how they're directing treatments and what are acceptable side effects of therapy and what aren't. And then, of course, with the media and the general public, we use some of what we learn in our awareness campaigns. And so all of this work at the end of the day, lots of people have input into the treatment and care that a patient is going to receive. HCPs, by the way, is healthcare professionals. And it sometimes feels like the patient doesn't have as much of a say as they would like in how, this is, how they are being treated. But the purpose of all this work is so that we can make them an equal voice. So you, how what you are experiencing and how your disease is progressing, exactly how you are experiencing it is what guides your treatment. And so we encourage all of you to take the upcoming survey, which will launch early in 2022. So please stay tuned for that. And that ends my presentation. So thank you so much for your attention. And I was more so pleased that uh, Susan asked me to participate.